Christ. Okay, this is May 8th, 2014, and Mary Merriman and Mark Stoner are conducting the interview. So, John and Charlie, John, could you kind of give me just your name and the date you were born? Uh, well, my name is John L. Johnson. I was born August 14, 1951. Uh, lived in southern Lancaster County. I was born in southern Lancaster County. Um, and your parents' names and any siblings? or? Uh, my father was Frank Don uh, Johnson. My mother was Doris Johnson. I have a brother, Lance, who lives in uh, Maryland, and a sister, Judy, who lives in Elizabethtown. They're both older than I am. I'm the baby of the family. <laughs> and w you said you grew up in Southern Lancaster County, and yeah, close to the Maryland line, between kind of between Quarryville and Oxford in that area. Okay. Yeah, my On father a farm? was a, my father was a he, yeah he was a farmer when I was born. Um, we had a my father worked on his his parents' farm, and when I was first born, we had a house nearby. But then when I was a uh, teenager, dad bought a farm and we moved to the farm. Another farmer joining my grandparents' farm. They both joined into each other. So I lived there uh, in my mid-teens till I left, left home to go to school. Okay. So, And then this is your partner, Charlie, correct? So my, yes. My give your full name and date of birth. Is Charles H. Mazur. Uh, I was... Uh, Born in uh, Lancaster, but I lived in uh, near Brownstown, near the log cabin restaurant. Actually, mm -hmm. um, my dad's name was Jack Mazur. My mom was Helen. There were four kids. I'm the third. My oldest sister is Carol. My older brother is Jack, and my younger sister is Joy. Okay, so. Uh, how about your early childhood? Like, where did you each go to school? And kind of religious background, if you have any. Okay, well, I went to a Little Britain elementary school. The little town, the little village I lived in, uh, the first house was a little village. It's called Little Britain. And I went to a Little Britain elementary school, which was right up the street from uh, our house. And I went there until uh, sixth grade, I guess sixth grade, from first to sixth, and then from seven to 12, I went to Slanko High School in Quarryville. And I was a crossing guard for a while at Little Britain at the elementary school. <laughs> I had one of the... Safety patrol, right? Yeah, or safety patrol, yeah, because I remember the blue metal policeman that would, was standing along the street. <laughs> and... Uh, I, uh, um, well, I guess. I well, from high school, did you have any education after that? Yeah, I went to, uh, I, um, after high school, I worked for a little while in a clothing store in Oxford, and then I went to um, York Academy of Arts in York, and that was in 1969, and I went there. That was a three year school at the time, and I graduated in 72. Uh, and um, then I worked at the Bonton department store doing visual merchandising. And I worked out of the main store in New York on uh, uh, West Market Street. And I was there for about um, three, three years, I guess, something like that. And I stayed in the main store for a while, and then I used to travel to the different stores, helping with the store displays, the visual merchandising aspect of it. And uh, so I was there until he and I met in 75, and then I moved back to Lancaster. Okay. Now, how about you, Charlie? And I went to elementary school at Brownstown Elementary School, and then on to junior high and high school at Conestoga Valley, graduating in 1966. After that, I went to a technical school down in Washington, D.C., called Career Academy School of Dental Technology. After that, I enlisted into the Air Force, where I received four more years in dental technology, um, serving uh, uh, at Charleston Air Force Base for one year, 
And then I get orders on going to Germany. So I was there in, for two years, and they closed that base, and I went to Spain, right outside of Madrid, for my last year. And what years would have that been? That would have been 68 to 72. So right in the Vietnam era. Right in the Viet during the Vietnam War. And I decided to enlist in the Air Force for four years rather than getting drafted into the Army because my chances of not going to Vietnam were much better. And I, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not ashamed to admit that. <laughs> And so then after the military? Then after the military, I came back to Lancaster, and I've been working locally in different laboratories since 72, uh, and I retire in two weeks. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> on my birthday, on my 66th birthday, on May 23rd. So <laughs> What a way to start off the Memorial Day yeah. weekend, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and I also, during that time, I also... Uh, has my uh, certification in dental laboratory work for since 75, as long as we've been together, until the present time. So how did you two meet? We, um, I came out when I was in, uh, while I lived in New York, I came out, I, that was 1972, I guess, and I, my parents lived, at that time they had sold, well no, they sold the farm a little bit later than that, but uh, I would come down to, uh, Lancaster on weekends, and I uh, had a gay friend that I knew in Oxford where I used to work, and he and I would get together on weekends and go out. It was just a social thing, and uh, we'd go to different clubs and things. And he introduced m me to Charlie um, uh, in, Lancaster. in Lancaster at the, uh, what was the bar? The Fiddler. the Fiddler on Prince Street on uh, July 6th, 1975. And the reason we remember that date is because something was written in my mom's diary that had something not indirectly. I knew that it was the same day, you know, when I read, because she always kept a diary of things. And um, But George, our, my friend George from, a, well, mutual friend George McMichael from Oxford introduced Charlie and I that, that night. George McMichael. Yeah. So, why don't you go back a little bit and say how you first started realizing you were gay or what oh, things were like? Well, I, well I, ever since I was very young, I knew something was different and of course you didn't know, I didn't know what it was. Um, I was probably, honestly, probably like five or so when I started being aware that things weren't the same. And I lived in a pretty, not I don't want to say a redneck area, but a very, you know. Well, it was Southern Lancaster County. Yeah, I mean. yeah, it was. Yes, it was. And uh, my parents were very, um, they weren't strict. They were very religious as far as going to all the, you know, the uh, Sunday morning services, Sunday evening services, uh, uh, training union on Wednesday nights and then vacation Bible school and all that stuff and my father taught some and uh, and and I just uh, I dated different you know girls just uh, you know casual type of dating situation and um, I just knew something wasn't right and I didn't know enough about what went on other places to even realize what it was and I just kind of thought that okay one day I'm gonna wake up and everything's gonna be the way I think normal is, and uh, you know, I'm going to meet somebody and have a house with a white picket fence and a couple of children, all that stuff. But it just never, you know, it didn't work out that way, and I'm glad it didn't. But uh, um, I, uh, I, I think when I when I was in art school, I had a girlfriend there, and then um, when uh, let's see. I guess I, I actually I had a, uh, I came out because I met a, or I had an, a friend of mine had an apartment in York on East King Street and he had a room available and I moved around different times when I was in York and he had a room available in his apartment and I rented that room and then he decided to move out so I took the whole apartment and then I realized I needed somebody else to help pay the rent so 
when I worked for the Bon Ton, there was a guy who worked uh, in one of the Bon Ton stores in the shoe department, I think it was, and he needed a room, so I um, rented the extra room to him. And then he, I wasn't really out at the time, but he kind of tried to get on that side of me. And I, he wasn't my type at all, so I kind of, you know, said no to that. But then he wanted to introduce me to someone in York. Someone wanted to meet me in York, and uh, it was a, a school teacher in York. And that's when I came out. You know, I, that's my first experience. And um, uh, then I had, um, then I met, I, I was with that guy for a little, not very long, really, and then I met somebody who was, worked for a nursery in York um, because they used to, the Bonton used to have these big flower shows every spring, spring flower show, and I met this guy through uh, the nursery that provided all the flowers. And then, um, and then there were a couple of other people I dated, and then he and I met in 75, and uh, we've been together ever since. And just to retract or go yeah. back a little bit, you mentioned your parents. What religious affiliation did they oh, have? Oh, they were Southern Baptist. And I came out to them. Um, I, they knew Charlie. I had brought Charlie down to see them, you know, just when we were together. Just We stopped in for a little bit or something like that. And so they knew Charlie. But then, um, like I say, I used to have to travel for the bond time. And... and I, I came home one weekend. I was having some back issues, and I came home one weekend, and then I was going to leave from my parents' house to go down to, I think it was a store in West Virginia. And we had a snowstorm, and I couldn't go. And my back was bothering me a lot. My dad took me to, a doc, to the doctor's, and he gave me some Valium or something for a bad back. <laughs> and I kind of, that, that one night, I was, and I just kind of suddenly told my parents, that I was gay. And what year would have this been? That was um, approximately. Uh, well, 70. we met in 75, so it might have been 76 or okay. something like that. Not too long, maybe a few months after he and I met. And um, my father started preaching kind of, and then he, he suddenly clammed up. And he wouldn't say anything. And then my mom went upstairs, so I went up and talked to her for a while. and. Uh, you know, they say, well, we'll get you help if you want therapy and all that stuff. And I, you know, I didn't, I didn't really want that. But um, then the next day, I left to go on my, to work in West Virginia. So I left them f uh, for several days. You know, I didn't, I mean, I didn't live in, at, with them except on weekends. And uh, so I was away for a while just to let them kind of sort things out. And it bothered my dad quite a bit, even though he's not demonstrative. He wasn't demonstrative or that type of person. It really kind of bothered him. And he went to see a doctor, my mom said about it, for his stomach and everything. And, and um, uh, we did, mom said she, she said it'd probably be a good idea if I didn't bring Charlie around for a while, just till they kind of got used to the idea. So what, they, they did like him. They did like him, yeah. And they knew him. So it wasn't, you know, they, they knew him. So um, we would, uh, we kind of made it a habit, if, like if he and I were together on a weekend, we would stop in there for just to visit them on our way to someplace else, you know, just pop in for a few minutes and say hi and that kind of thing. And now, um, you know, and then we kind of, because I understand, I, I certainly don't feel that, you know, I didn't expect them to welcome the situation with open arms. And, the, and um I think they kind of thought, or maybe mom did, that maybe I was, but they weren't really. You know, they kind of thought about it, didn't they? I guess they put it out of their mind. But, um, you know, after, uh, after the initial bumpy road, I guess, you know, they just all accepted, both our families accepted us completely. And um, uh, I just, there was so much hypocrisy in the Southern Baptist or at least in our Southern Baptist Church. And I went to church from the time I was born until I left home. And um, uh, there was just so much, and everybody was very religious at church. And then you found out the choir director was having an affair with the uh, pianist, the organist, or whatever. And, you know, all these things were going on. And I just, 
I, and my, my mother told me later on that she didn't like Southern Baptists. Because, but my father's parents were Southern Baptists, and they almost insisted that when mom and dad got married that she joined the church. So, but we had a situation, I don't know how much you want me to get into things, but we had a situation where we were, our church was interviewing a new, for a new minister, and the minister was from down south someplace, and the husband, the, the minister himself, his family didn't come up, but my parents hosted him to stay while he was being interviewed for the church, and he made a play for my mother. And my brother, who was older, stopped it. But this was a big guy. And I didn't know that until sometime later that that actually happened, because my brother was older than I was. And that really, you know, and they actually, he actually got the job. He was a minister at our church for I don't know how many years. In fact, he married my brother and his uh, fiance. He was the minister at their wedding. But it's just like it's something I got, you know, it just you hear later on when you go back and think about all these things, you think, well, you know, it's, <laughs> I just, I couldn't believe that when I found out about that. And so you're not really no, practicing? I, uh, I, no, I kind of, my, not to get off on a different tangent, but I have, uh, my feeling is that um, there are so many religions that want, you to think that theirs is the right way of doing things and everybody else is not right. And I don't, the organized part of it I don't like because uh, people in third world countries who know nothing about the Bible and you know, all that, it's almost like saying, well, they're, you know, because they don't know of organized religion, they're not right. And, and, and uh, so as a result of that, I don't uh, have any kind of a strong of affiliation with a particular church. I, I believe there's something, you know, and I, like I say, I was in church from the time I was born to I was probably 19 or so. And um, uh, I just, you know, I don't, you know, I just don't, uh, there's something there, but I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. I'm, <laughs> I'm not atheist, I'm, ag I guess, agnostic or something. Is that right? <laughs> So, Charlie, how about now? We covered quite a bit there. Yeah, my answer so, won't be as long. Ah, yeah. <laughs> but um, starting kind of with your childhood before you met and kind of how you first started to come out or what your journey was there. I think when I was young, I think I knew I was gay, but again, I didn't quite understand it. And uh, going through high school, I had some girlfriends. and. Uh, then when I went down to to school in D.C. and then in the service, I uh, I had girlfriends. I dated a German girl for a while, and then I think I realized then that this isn't the path I should be on. So uh, I had also been experimenting in high school and in D.C. and in the service. Uh, so I kind of knew where I was should be headed. Uh, so then I came back and met John in 75, and we've been together. Um, but I did date a German girl, and uh, fortunately, nothing every once, all, every once in a while he reminds me of that German yes, girl I like, used to date. Um, <laughs> oh, as far as uh, religious affiliation, uh, my, our parent, my parents took the took the family to uh, uh, United Church of Christ in Leola, Hellers. And uh, we went there faithfully till I graduated from high school. And then when I left the area, uh, that pretty much was the end of organized religion for me. Back to other relationships or anything. Did, did, did either of you have significant relationships with either? I mean, you mentioned with a girlfriend, but before the two you met, or? No, before I met John, I think I, da I dated a, a guy for just a few months, uh, and that was the only, that was, I mean, it was just a very short time. Yeah, so, uh, oh, go ahead. No, well, I don't, I didn't have any, <clears throat> I didn't have any kind of significant long-term relationship with anybody before I met him. I might have been with uh, 
the guy I knew before him, I might have been with a, a couple months. I'm not sh I can't even remember the time frame there, but it wasn't a long period of time. When you just come out, it's, I think you're, there's such a huge relief when you finally do come out that it's almost like you, you uh, I don't know, you lose track of time or something. It's just like after all these years of not really knowing you know, what was going on and, um, and not, understanding. not understanding why you feel the way you do and th thinking that there's nobody else that feels that way. And, but like, you know, like it's kind of like the first person you're ever with, because I never experimented until I was, until I met this guy that I told you about that was a school teacher in York. Um, so I'd never had any kind of a sexual experience with um, men. And I never had a real sexual experience with any women. I dated several women when I was younger, you know. And, and uh, I, there was one girl I was kind of serious about who was, couple years younger than me, but her brother, or her uh, father, forbade me to see her because of my brother's reputation. He thought I was <laughs> going to be the same as my brother. Yeah. And, um, and then I had, when I was uh, outside, uh, a girl I went to art school with, I dated her, and, uh, but we didn't do anything physical until one, one night, uh, my sister, after my sister and her husband had a baby, we, Joanne and I babysat at the house so that my sister and brother-in-law could go out for New Year's Eve, and and uh, it just didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the next the next morning, Joanne left to go back to Philadelphia to her parents' place, and then I had uh, breakfast with my sister and brother-in-law and nephew. And uh, my brother-in-law said to me, "Well, John, you know, I always thought you were probably gay, but since Joanne was here, I guess you're not." Not. <laughs> and it's. And you know, and I had never really done anything at that time. Mm -hmm. And then when I told, when I, I, I was actually kind of with Joanne when I did come out, or when I had my first experience, and then when I went to tell Joanne, I thought she would be very emotional and cry and all this stuff. And she, then she said, well, that figures everybody I go out with ends up being gay. <laughs> <laughs> she just took it as a matter of fact. So, you know, that was my only, somewhat sexual experience for a woman. And I just never, I didn't, like, I, I didn't experiment at all. I was terrified in school. You know, I, the, the opportunity never, I didn't see it as, you know, not an experimental phase at all. I was, you know, in uh, gym class and everything. I was just, so it was all kind of like, really kind of scary in a way, for me anyway. Mm -hmm. So, and Charlie, you didn't really get into yet the relationship with your family and what if you came out to them or when? Or well, I really didn't. I told my brother. And this would have been when, just to give up? Uh, when I was in the service, I guess. I think I called him. Yes, because I, I actually, the German girl that I was dating, uh, I broke up with her. So I called him. I thought, someone in the family, I need to tell somebody in the family. And he, I thought, he being older than me and being, and he was also in the service and he had gone to school, I thought he would understand better because he'd been exposed to more situations than my parents or my, I couldn't tell my sister. It's more so. worldly. <laughs> more wor worldly. So I, I wrote a letter, explained it to him, came out to him, uh, and he was fine. He sort of guessed that anyway. So, but I never did come out to my parents, but I, I realized after we met that they just understood whether my brother told them or they just realized it. I'm not sure. Hmm. But I just never really came out to them directly. Maybe I took the cowardly way. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that was a very common way. I think. Yeah. But <laughs> everybody, I mean. It just kind yeah. of gradually became known yeah. without you sitting down and telling yeah. them specifically. Yeah. But our families and extended families have accepted. Yeah, I mean, ever since, uh, for years, both our families have, you know, we get together on Christmas Eve here, and, uh, you know, we're just a big family now, and it's never, even my parents, as, uh, my father was always a very quiet man, and uh, my mom was a more sociable one, but she would always ask how Charlie was doing, you know, if I talked to her on the phone, and 
Um, uh, they were in Willow Valley retirement community before they both passed away, but uh, you know, she would always, when she was of sound mind, she would always say, now, tell Charlie hi. Mm -hmm. Or you know, if he would go see him, she she knew there toward the end she didn't know anybody who anybody was, but uh, they were very, very uh, accepting of the whole thing. And as it turns out, I have uh, uh, a couple nephews that are gay, and um, you know, and it's kind of interesting because my brother, my older brother, who uh, um, uh, pro probably, well. He's, he was kind of a run around when he was younger, and his one of his sons, and my brother had a lot of trouble when I came out with it, even though my brother was kind of, got in a lot of trouble when he was younger. And my sister was fine with it, but my brother, my, his wife at the time told me that he had a lot of trouble accepting it. And he was, you know, like I say, he ran around so much when he was young, it's, I thought of all people he would probably understand it more, but he, she said he had a lot of trouble with it. Now, are either of your parents living Charlie? No, they're both deceased. Okay. Yeah, we're both orphans. And I knew orphans I knew now. that they accepted John when they started sending a birthday card with a five dollar bill and like <laughs> everybody else. I thought, okay, they they accepted him. So. <laughs> and my dad continued that even after my mother passed away. So, for him to do that, I knew he accepted it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how people like like they'll accept it in their own. You know, like my dad, like I say, wasn't real communicative with his feelings or anything, but you know, it's it's nice how they all accept it in their own way, and you know, and I, I never expected them to completely accept the whole thing. I mean, I think some people might, when they tell their families, if they're not welcome with open arms completely, I think they think that their parents should or, you know, they just don't know. I just, I can understand how it would be difficult for, you know, and uh, I didn't expect them to accept everything wholeheartedly to begin with, but, uh, you know, so for us, did. yeah. In fact, we, Charlie and I went to Canada about 10 or 12 years ago, our first time to Canada. My mother asked my sister if she thought that Charlie and I went there to get married. <laughs> and, uh, so we thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, that she, she, she even just matter, think, matter of fact married. later, my sister said, Judy, do you think John and Charlie were going to get married in Canada? We weren't even thinking about that. Right. <laughs> so. Well, now, how about now? Do you think about it more these days? And just in yeah. context, yeah. Pennsylvania, it's still uh, illegal to marry, but a lot of our surrounding states right. yeah. can get married. Now, we've been talking about it, you yeah. um, know. We, we probably will. I, I'm kind of waiting until Pennsylvania gets on board. This is, I think, they they will. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you want, want to do it at home, huh? Well, that'd be nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, we know people that are getting that have got married in Maryland or other states, and we're not um, sure. Uh, Financially, how it's helping them, or you know, we just. Uh, but we're there's things we have to do now that we're both retired, going to be retired. Um, we're going to get some of these things done. Yes. <laughs> when, how has the idea of marriage, or like back when you guys met, was that even anything you thought of, or what was the well, what was your view of marriage then? Maybe that's. You mean as far as yeah, gay, well, gay, gay, gay couples getting married or just marriage in general or our feelings of... I would say gay couples getting married or how you defined relationships then or what well, a gay we, relationship was. When we met, there was no gay marriage, so it wasn't really on our, on my radar. I thought, you know, just I, you live know, together and, and do the legal part that you can. And, did, what, how soon after you met did you decide to live together? Well, we. Are you uh, well, we. We were living together. Well, I lived in York when we met, and then not too long after we met, I moved to Lancaster. We and each owned a house in the city, so we were either at his house or at my house. 
And uh, we thought, well, this is crazy. You know, let's sell them both and buy one. So we did. That's what we did. But it was six years till we bought this house. But we were really to living together. Before. Yeah, we were only about nine nine blocks away from each other in the city, and um, we. Uh, I think I was in the process of buying. Well, you had house. your apartment when I first met you, yeah, but I and then I moved. I moved back house. to Lancaster after we met. I left the Bon Ton in New York and moved to Lancaster to work at Plastino and Owens, which was a design firm mm -hmm. on Oregon Pike. And I lived with my parents for a couple months because I was going to look for a house. And then I found a big house that needed an awful lot of work. And and then he found a house at that time because he had an apartment when we first met. And then. So we were both kind of working on these two houses, and then. Um, but it was at the time when it was fashionable to move into the city, and the houses were really inexpensive. So we thought, well, let's do this and get something cheap, each of us, and then. Uh, actually, then just a few years later, we sold them both, and we made a nice profit. Yeah, we just houses. thought we wanted to buy one together rather than moving into one or the other. Mine was too small. His needed too much work. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah I, mine was in horrible shape. It hadn't had anything done for years. And I worked on it. And then I was sick for a while and stayed with my parents. And then when I came back to Lancaster, I just decided that uh, I just, it was just too much work. you know. And since we'd been together at that point uh, five years or something like that, six, yeah. we, six years, we'd just decided to get something together to sell them both. And we didn't have any trouble selling our houses at all back then. It made economic sense. Yeah, yeah. So this was the, uh, was this the second house we looked at or the first one? This is the first. The first one, yeah. So we bought this one in 1981, been here ever since. I thought we'd be here five years, maybe then move to another <laughs> one. <laughs> and 30 some years later, we're still here. I talked him out of it. <laughs> well, you kept making this one nicer and nicer. I said you kept making this one nicer oh, and well, nicer. We, yeah, we had done a lot here. And we, it's, uh, we both have a lot of, uh, it's nice because there are, we have a lot of strong similarities as far as interest goes, but yet we do each have our own personality and sometimes we get on each other's nerves. And <laughs> no, we don't. Yes. No, we don't. <laughs> So you said you met at the Fiddler, and that was like on Prince Street at Stevens' house, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, that, yeah. That it, predates me. Oh, the, oh, okay. No, it was a restaurant Just, during the week. What was it called? I mean, it was called during the daytime. I think it out. was called the Frog Restaurant. It was a nice restaurant, and then when they closed that at like ten, then it became the Fiddler. It was a disco. It was mm -hmm. a disco. This and they had a DJ. And there. they were only there for maybe, at the most, four years. Four or five years. I'm not sure. I don't know how long it was there before I started going there. But then there was two places. You can go to the Tally Ho mm -hmm. or the Fiddler at the time. And it was only like a block. Or the, the Railroad place. House in Marietta. Well, that's, yeah, outside. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and we did used to go out a lot. Then. It, it was, uh, I think it was more on my... I think when you come out, you kind of come out with a bang or something, and you're, you know, you want to be with people like yourself so much. And uh, I mean, I don't know, you know, for other people, I'm not sure what was really like, but back then it was just like holy mackerel, you know, this is, well, this is a whole new world for me. And like I say, it's, it's, so it yeah, new, you didn't yeah. have those worries about anything. Yeah, you know, but it was just so nice to be around people that you could be yourself with, mm -hmm. you know. So we went to we went to Harrisburg on occasion. We would go to Philly, Philly, and Baltimore, and Baltimore. Yeah. When not, we could stay awake past Baltimore, ten o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> and to the shore. And where is sh as a shore? Rehoboth Beach Rehoboth mostly. Beach. Atlantic City. We used to go to Atlantic City. Started out at Atlantic City. Uh, when I before I knew him, I went there. Yeah. Uh, Vacation, but, uh, Mostly Rehoboth Beach in Atlantic City, and we've been to like Fire Island, uh, but that was later on. Yeah. So socially, you met people mostly through the bars and things, or were there other organizations you got involved with, or social things? No, more through just friends of friends. Yeah, 
I, back then, I, yeah, I don't think there was, that was probably not the only avenue, I guess, but um, we liked to dance, you know, and all that stuff, and I guess we just kind of gravitated did, more yeah. toward that. And then we met, yeah, we met people through there that we developed, uh, you know, friendships with. But then in the late 70s, right, as Hayes was hitting, uh, a whole group of our friends locally moved out to Calif San California, yeah. Like and 78 or 79. It was like maybe 10 people that we knew that moved away. And we almost decided that we would do that too. But then, maybe, I'm not sure, we just decided not to do that. Um, but there's I think only almost the whole group that moved out died, yeah. have since passed. So we lost. So we lost a lot of good friends. Mm -hmm. We lost really the majority of our close friends in those years. Yes. Yeah. And so, so they would have moved out just prior to the. Eight, they started moving out like maybe late 70s. 78, 79. And then that's when it started out there. And we knew, we knew people that had died. I mean, since then, we knew of people that had died, and then at the time, they didn't know what it was necessarily. Or, they, or else they would, somebody would say, well, he died of something, but they didn't say that. You know, it was, they didn't say it was AIDS at the time. They just said, well, he had some kind of cancer or something. But it was just very, it was a difficult So that was a time. hard, that was a turning point for me. Yeah. Meeting all those friends yeah. at one time. Sorry. Yeah. A lot of close, we, yeah, I mean, time. most of our, most of our really close friends at the time we lost, actually. Because I guess we all kind of ran around a lot and, I mean, not. But I always you know, thought but, if we had moved out there, we would probably be on that same list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, we're still here. <laughs> And then did that affect any organizations and things that you got involved in? I know there were... Well, yes, then we got... Uh, well, then locally, there's the AIDS project, extra AIDS project, and... Uh, Betty Finney House. Betty Finney. So we got involved in, in AIDS auctions. Like, and why don't you just say what both of those organizations were, just so we... Lancaster AIDS project. It was, a, it was an organization to uh, support people that became ill and to look for help to find the cure and help them financially. And, and the Betty Finney and the House? the Betty Finney House was pretty much the same, as I understand it. Now, both of them have morphed into other organizations. But, but we, have a, we have a good friend. Um, she doesn't live here anymore, but she was very instrumental in getting donations from celebrities. She, she was the type of woman that could, she'd go into Broadway, into New York City, and knock on back doors in theaters. And she, she had the kind of personality that she could get celebrities to give her signed photographs and playbills. And she got some incredible stuff from celebrities. She had the kind of personality that she could do that where, um, you know, so a lot of people. A, she built a, a good relationship with a lot of people yeah. in that genre that she would just contact them and they would send stuff to her. They would almost be waiting for her to call. Yeah, and she had such a great year, personality. They would, she would send them like thank you notes, you know, whereas a lot of people wouldn't maybe do that. But she would send but them thank you notes. And, yeah, and right, she and really, she deal. really, um, she was involved with uh, Paul Newman's, that camp, what was the camp called that he was, as a lot of celebrities were involved with that. Um, but she met a lot of celebrities through, I forget the name, it was a, like a children's camp. But Paul Newman was, yeah. yeah. But um, she met a lot of celebrities through that too, who Pat, donated things. Pat Mass Andrea. Mass Andrea, yeah. Very good friend. For the record, very yeah. good, yeah. <laughs> right, and for years she kind of spearheaded some of those yes. options yes. and things for, for both years. organizations, yeah, right? She was on the committee and she, Several Got years. Both of us involved in, in doing that. And then we went to some of the marches in Washington, um, and we were down there for when the AIDS quilt was part of mm -hmm. the AIDS quilt was shown. I don't remember the years of all that. And we helped 
sponsor a panel for us. Yeah, I, I designed a uh, panel mm -hmm. for our friend Michael Wiggins, who died, and I did a mm -hmm. portrait of him and then a woman we know who quilts. So she, she made the uh, patch. She quilted or sewed the patch. And uh, so we went down for that. And other one. friends of his donated a panel. She put them all together yeah. in one bigger panel yeah. for the quilt. Hmm. Are there any other organizations you remember locally, like at that time or even in the 70s before? Not, uh, not gay related. No, I mean just no, just like the social things, just like the pot, men's potluck thing. But as far as uh, mm -hmm. directly related to AIDS, um, I can't think of anything. No. Off We're involved with a lot of organizations locally, but like arts organizations and historical organizations. Any special ones that or. Well, oh, DeMuth. we're both DeMuth. involved with the DeMuth Foundation mm -hmm. Museum. Mm -hmm. And the Fulton. The Fulton. Um, and the uh, uh, LancasterHistory.org, Lancaster right the across the street. The street. And, Historic uh, Preservation Trust. Have you seen any changes in any of those organizations with their comfort level or oh, well, the, uh, of homosexuality? Yeah, uh, the Fulton and the DeMuth. Um, uh, yeah, they're um, they're Demuth, both. Demuth was gay anyway, so <laughs> Fulton may have been too. <laughs> well, he yeah. was at least by. Yeah, but then no, I I think th but there's a lot of people that are on the on different boards who were you know who were are gay or were gay. Or, I mean, it's so it's they, talked about so much more now, which is so good that um, it's just a very comfortable. I think it's a very comfortable conversation that people are having now, even locally, you know, and I, and uh, people like at the DeMuth, we belong to the De DeMuth uh, Foundation Museum uh, since the 80s, I guess, right? Since it started. Yeah, and we, you know, belong there as a couple, and so everybody, and there, I mean, there are some gay people that belong there, there's not a lot of, it's, you know, there's not a lot of, there are, I mean, there's probably more than I think there are, I guess, but uh, it's very, yeah, the, and the Fulton, I mean, the shows they're putting on now, and it's very, it's become a much more progressive um, area, I think, an accepting area. We've never had any problems being accepted. Yeah, we never had any altercations with anybody. Um, on this block, this block is very... Yeah, our block, when we moved here, we were the boys on the corner. <laughs> and because when we moved here, most of the people were very old on the street, and we were the boys on the corner. We were young. We were in our 30s. <laughs> Such a catch, right? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. And several of our neighbors are... Uh, yeah, we have, you know, yeah, two folks this way and yeah. one over here. And <laughs> um, so one of the things, like with the DeMuth Foundation, did you, not just the treatment of you, but the treatment of the subject of Charles DeMuth or his homosexuality, has that changed in your lifespan since you've seen? Well, it's discussed. Well, I think um, they, they exhibit more of his gay art now than when they first opened. Mm -hmm. They'd be more. They were, yeah, they were, they were more discreet. Of course, they, they didn't own any at the time. Now they have it. Right. And they, a yeah, and they, they will show them during the, some of the exhibits when they put his things up. Uh, they'll show uh, them. Yeah, I think. Right. The first time I remember was a little sketch of a sailor urinating. Oh, yeah. And it had a description, something like, it's a little understood aspect of DeMuth's personality right. or something. Well, some, yeah. of the, some, of the older, some of the older books that talk about DeMuth kind of allude to that. You know, they don't come out and say it, but they kind of refer to that. But, uh, no, they discuss, they discuss that during, uh, like if we go to a, like a board meeting or, so, or right. something, you know, mm -hmm. a meeting, they will discuss, yeah. they'll discuss that. Did it change at all, though? That's kind of what I was, in the, if you've been so involved they're, they're in a long more, time. It's more prominent this way. I mean, before it was kind of... I mean, the yes, subject of his homosexuality? Yeah, yeah I, I think it's 
it's changed more. Yeah. It's more, yeah, it's more talked about now than it was, I would Plus say. Plus more, more people know who we is than they did. And nobody, yeah. nobody that we know has any problem, you know, mm -hmm. nobody that we know that belongs to that has any kind of a problem with that whatsoever. Um, but I think, you yeah. know, and the Fulton, I mean, the shows they put on at the Fulton now, I think that's much more, um, of course, I don't, I mean, years ago, I didn't go to the Fulton that much when you and I first got together, I don't yeah. think, did I? You, you uh, belonged there for a long time, did The theater is on. Gangs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, as far as politically or uh, like kind of how you dealt with gay rights or has that changed for you over time or how, how what was it like when you first met? How's that changed? Or has it? Um. Well, I don't know that it's, personally, I don't know that it's changed that much for me. Yeah, personally, I guess, I, I can't, I, I can't put, um, I, well, I mean, there are, just from what you, you know, what you hear about and read about, and, um, it's, it's it's good that it's becoming discussed so much more in more mainstream uh, situations like TV and things. Uh, but I don't uh, since we never really had a problem with uh, you know I don't know that it's really changed for us personally too much. You were ahead of your time. Well, no, I, it's just, uh, I'm not strong. We were more politic, politically <laughs> involved, I guess, years ago. I guess probably th when the AIDS, especially because of the AIDS. Different marches. We were much more involved back then. But then um, we did it more because other people were doing it. We just went along with them. And well, and because it started, you know, when so many people yeah. that we knew were dying. Um, that was probably the most political that that we've been involved with anything that's related to being gay, you know, specifically mm -hmm. gay issues. I'm not political to begin with, so <laughs> he's a little more political than I am. But, well, yeah. <laughs> but obviously, like you said, that the whole AIDS crisis was a big turning point yeah. right. for you. Right, and now it's not as... Well, well people are still prominent. getting, no, but young people are still getting it's sick. Not as it doesn't seem to be as prominent because it's not as severe or deadly. Well, as right. Mm -hmm. so it's yeah, but younger people are getting it because they don't, there are so many young people that weren't around at that time don't understand what the power of, of that when that happened, and they're not being as careful as they should, so... Are there challenges you st still see remaining or things you hope for? Well, you mentioned marriage in Pennsylvania. Well, that would be, yeah, I'm sure it's going to happen. Um, I'm surprised how fast it is happening throughout the country. I thought it would take a lot longer and a lot more setbacks. Step forward and then three steps mm -hmm. back. But it seems to be moving forward. At a really good pace. I think because that conversation is going on so much, um, whether it's somebody that's for gay marriage or somebody that's against gay marriage, the, the fact that the conversation is going on and it's being discussed is really good, like I say, even if it is pro or con, just because people are talking about it more. And I think the more, um, you know, in the next, com uh, next several years, the more gay the more issues like that that are brought up and discussed, I think it, it'll make things easier. And I know for some people it wouldn't be. We, I think we were probably lucky that we didn't have any um, kind of repercussions or anything serious to deal with as far as coming out goes. Uh, you know, we were never 
bothered by anybody or um, so I, you know I guess if somebody was really had a lot of trouble when they came out they would view things differently I was not really bullied in high school but I or not bullied is not the right word but just I was picked on some because I was kind of quiet and everything and you, school developed these cliques and mm -hmm. and uh, but never Never from a gay perspective, I would say, because I, I didn't even know what that meant at the time. I was just kind of quiet and more in where I was, is, even as a kid, I would, I'm the type of person who kind of observe what's going. I kind of felt like I was kind of outside observing things mm -hmm. going on rather than being. I had friends in school, but I, school was not particularly a good time for me, especially high school, I guess just because there were so many things going on in my head that I couldn't understand. <laughs> and, I think for a lot of young people, uh, they're much more accepting of gays, and it's not even going to be an issue as there's a younger generation comes, comes along. I think it's going to be totally accepted, and except for some of the older people. Do you have different expectations now than you would have had 30 years ago as far as those uh, types of things? I expect, yeah, I do. I think it's going to be so much more accepted. And I didn't expect that to happen so quickly. I think, like, when I, when I first came out back in the 70s, it was the disco thing and everything. And, like I say, I kind of came out gangbusters and so I was around so much I mean well we we both were I guess but my life kind of revolved around that lifestyle in a way because I didn't know how um, it's not like I built up to that kind of a, a way you know I just kind of when I came out I just uh, and you know, at the time you know I didn't know how else to do it it seemed like everybody was Back in those, those they everybody was dancing. And, so know, who's yeah. the better dancer? We, we haven't. We don't right. dance that much for. No, we don't oh, have dance in a while. You're not the better. <laughs> <laughs> so who was no or? I think <laughs> is that a? It was me. Okay. No. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any stories you remember about going out back then, or just? What a typical night would be like, or well, we wouldn't start getting everybody back then. You wouldn't start getting ready till about eleven o'clock at night on a Saturday night. You wouldn't even take your shower. You wouldn't even get ready. Think of going out until eleven o'clock usually, and then you'd get ready and go out. And uh, back back then, we used to stay out till oh three or four in the morning, maybe on Sunday mornings. Then we go out breakfast the uh, local what was that restaurant called? Denny's or something. Dempsey's. And a lot of people did that back then. No, we didn't then. do that every would stay, No, it was, you know, it'd stay, stay out late and then you'd go to bed and sleep until 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, something like that. Now we're more practical. Now we're in bed by 9 o'clock. We go to a restaurant, <laughs> have a couple of drinks, and we're home by. Yeah. <laughs> and if we're out, we don't really go out that much locally um, as far as. Someplace like a strong, like a gay bar or anything like that, too much. Well, if we're traveling someplace, we'll go out a little more. Yeah, we tend to go out when we go on vacation more than locally. Okay, going way back again, how about, Charlie, your experience being gay in the military and what that was like back then? Well, like I said, I was dating the German girl, but I was also uh, keeping my eyes open for whatever. And uh, I had some experiences, always good, never bad. But it was just, uh, it wasn't with any particular person for any length of time. Uh, plus, being in Europe, it was much more open then. So when I would travel to different cities, I would meet people. With, uh, it was just a fun thing. It wasn't 
Well, and would you meet them by going out somewhere or just other military people or? Um, some other military people, yeah. I mean, there's, there certainly was gays in the military all the time. You know, it wasn't something that didn't exist. Plus, you know, just uh, people, citizens, just regular citizens. And where all were you stationed? Like, just in? Uh, well, the first year at Charleston, South Carolina, at the, at the big Air Force base in Charleston. And then I went to Germany, and I was stationed in a very small air base called Hof Air Station, which was at the time in the East German, West German, Czech border, up in that little corner. And uh, we were pretty much, it was an Air Force station, but we were pretty much a support facility for an even smaller army contingent that was also stationed there, but they also had what they called the site. And we never could get to the site. That was always kind of uh, off limits for most of us, of the people that were at the air station. You had to have a clearance to get into that. So we always assumed, because they called it the site, and we were up at the East German, West German Czech border, that was some kind of surveillance, some kind of spy, we never knew, but it was the army that would handle that part of it. And then as, I guess, the Cold War, War, the Cold War was winding down, they determined they didn't need to have this facility open, so they closed the whole base. It was just a very small base. I was the only dental technician. There were two dentists, two assistants, and myself uh, on this little air station. So they closed that. And then I had the option of going to England or going to Spain. And I had been to England on vacation, but I had not been to Spain, so this was right outside of Madrid, so I went there. And then I came back to, uh, I shipped a, I had bought a Volkswagen Bug when I was in Spain, not in Germany, but in Spain. And because I was a staff sergeant, I had the opportunity to ship a car home. So I had this little bug shipped back to the States and I picked it up at, at uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and drove it back home and had that for like 11 years. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your highest rank? What? Staff sergeant. Okay. And w when you were moving to different bases, was there any difference as far as in the different countries beliefs as far as homosexuality or um, did you No, it was pretty open, especially in your Charleston, South Carolina. When I went there, uh, when I went to Charleston there was a an interracial marriage that pe a, a guy and his wife was transferred to Charleston. Anyway. And, did you wanna uh, why? We can stop for a second. They were transferred to Charleston, South Carolina. And at the time... Let's just wait a second. And if you want to answer, you can go. No, it's probably just a sales call thing. Okay. At the time, this was would have been the 68. At the time, Charleston didn't accept interracial marriages. So this couple had to be transferred to another state because it was illegal for them to be there, married. So it was that kind of situation at Charleston. Uh, but as far as the gay life, there would have been people on the base, but uh, I don't remember anything really specific. Mm -hmm. But then out of the blue, I get orders, I'm going to Germany. I thought, wow, <laughs> this is pretty good. I never knew anybody that even left the country at that time. Huh. So you were excited about that move, huh? I was excited, and it ended up being a, a three-year vacation in Europe, pretty much. Now, I did have a little bit of guilt, thinking that I'm over here having a good time in Europe, and there people were in Vietnam. You know, mm -hmm. so was, a... was there anything else that you think we've missed that you wanted to say? Or um, um, I don't know. We, 
I just wanted to say we, um, well, we met in 75 for our 10th year anniversary. In 85, we went to Greece and spent two weeks there. And then um, we, it was 85, we went to Italy with two other friends. And then back in the late 80s or early 90s or something like that. But we were kind of, yeah. on our 20th anniversary, we spent two weeks in Amsterdam. And for our 30th, we went to, um, did I miss something here? Spain was the 30th. And then Germany was? Germany was about four years ago. Four years ago, yeah. Something like that. We kind of started this thing about going every 10 years someplace, but then we ended up, and we want to yeah. hopefully do more of that when Continue we. Continue some more travel. And I think everybody well, going to have your, country. what, 40th coming up, right? No, next 50. Year, next year will be 40th. 40th. 2015 will be our yeah. 40th. We haven't talked about <laughs> I want to get used to being in car before I make any plans, even for this year. So. I had to switch to a plug, I guess. It just suddenly went down to a minute on the battery. Okay. I thought we had 10 minutes in. Well, or are we okay? Is there? Let's just switch quick. Here you go. Okay. All right. We'll start again. And Charlie, you started to talk a little bit about the length of time you've been together and how. Yes. Yes. Um, when we, when you meet somebody, at least when we met back in '75, um, you just. Um, you like the person and you and you stay with them for a while and you really don't really plan on thinking, well, I want to stay with him for 50 years or whatever. You just, we didn't think about that. We just went day by day by day and soon, soon you realize we've been together 10 years and then it was 20 years and now it's close to 40. So you don't really plan or we didn't plan it. It just, it just kind of happens. And then you realize after so many years that well, yeah, we we are going to be together forever. You know, we don't even give it a thought that we won't be together. Yeah, well, I don't think because. But you don't really plan it. Yeah, you know, when I, uh, I didn't know anything about the gay lifestyle. I guess you'd say, but uh, not that I think there is a particular gay lifestyle. But um, back then, things people were more. Uh, it was more of a casual. You didn't sex know and a casual dating situation. I don't think you, uh, n I don't think you necessarily met somebody with the idea that you're going to develop a close relationship necessarily. Like right if away. a man, yeah, right away. It's more, I guess it's that way with a straight couple too. There's more of a physical thing at first or physical attraction at first. But we never knew anybody back then that had been together for any length of time. And I think because you don't, uh, back then nobody ever talked about a more, um, like going through dating and becoming engaged and planning a wedding and all that stuff. I don't, we didn't, you didn't really look at it that way back then because that wasn't even feasible, I guess. It wasn't on the radar, especially in this area. You know, maybe if you were in a bigger city, people talk some more about that type of thing. But you just kind of, yeah, you you didn't look at it that way. And I think... It, then as you stay even, together, then you you share experiences like losing our parents. And, uh, yeah, but yeah, but it, like you, do, you it's like a, it's like a married couple in that you do financially, you involve, you know, we're both involved with, you know, buying the house, buying the things for the house, and pay, paying the bills and everything, and it just kind of the two hundred nine fifty fifty because we bought the house. After. And a, a gay friend of ours worked at the phone company, and he got us that phone number. <laughs> Terry Gable, do you so remember we, Terry Gable? So we don't he want to give up our company. landline no. because that, we like that number. Mm -hmm. he, but yeah, it it wasn't look you know, back then. You didn't look at it the same way that a straight couple would look at developing a relationship. Uh, Necessarily long term relationship. So and it's a. Family, it's just when did it change for you? I mean, because obviously when you bought the house together, you must have had some kind of. Well, yeah. Was, but, you know. Well, we bought it together 
because it was the economical way to do it. Well, it just made sense because we well, yeah. had two houses nine blocks away from each other. It just was kind of stupid. But then we thought, well, you know, this is working, so I guess we're going to be together. And, and we then we realized that, yeah, we are going to be together. You know, there's, you know. So when do you think that changed? Um, well, well uh, how many, we, we had an attorney, uh, how many, mm -hmm. how many, we, we had an attorney four or five years ago draw up some paperwork for us, you know, wills, longer what, more longer than that, than that. Um, but, uh, and we realize now that we have to do some more specific, make some more specific plans in that respect, and we've started to talk somewhat about how much longer we can stay in this house um, because it's a lot of upkeep financially and physically, just all the work that's all. In an older house, you're always fixing something. Or, but um, we're, I think we've just in the past couple years started to realize more that we need to be better prepared for what, prepared. Yeah. yeah, better prepared for what will happen um, eventually. And because we don't have children that would take care of us, you have to think about, um, you know, that where we would, who would end up, where we would end up going. Um, and uh, so we're actually, in the past couple of years, our eyes have been opened a little bit more to all of that. And then because of all the um, people talking about the gay marriage and everything. Oh, it's, it's coming, it's, and I, like, yeah, as you get older and your parents are, are passing away and everything, you kind of realize, you know, we really do need to do something because even though our families, our families that are still living family members, would n neither, none of them would give either one of us any problem with, you know, that, that aspect of things, like when one of us is gone. Um, obviously, legally, we have to to uh, work things out, and, but we haven't really. Yeah, pretty good shape, that yeah, but I mean, I think there's we probably need to be a little bit more, and we're you know we start kind of thinking about selling, all, downsizing somewhat possessions and things like that, and trying to do with a little bit less than we have now. But, but it's I, not an urgent. Situation. No, it's not an urgent thing, but you never know what can happen, you know. So um, it's a little more in the forefront because I dealt with my parents. Uh, um, my sister and I, I only worked, I've been working part-time for the past four years and I'm basically retired now completely, but my sister and I dealt a lot with my parents when they moved to Willow Valley and their health issues and dad had Alzheimer's and mom had dementia, so I'm, uh, there's a lot of men in my family that had Alzheimer's and uh, so you start thinking about all these things, especially when you go to uh, a place like that and you're dealing with your parents plus the uh, other residents, you start thinking about all these things, you know. You, and they, my parents were very well prepared. They prepared, um, they were well prepared to make that step, uh, you know. They didn't leave us in the lurch or anything. They Financially, they were well prepared for all that. And, and uh, But my sister and I spent a lot of time, a lot of stressful time dealing with them, trying to get them both to appointments at the same time and getting them in the car at the same time. And that was very stressful. And um, to lose your parents that way, where you can't even really talk to them for a couple of years, you know, before they're gone, it's very difficult because it's not like you were talking to them one night and the next night they're gone. You just gradually, they slip away from you. And uh, so you it makes you think a little more about do you think it's different between a gay couple and a straight couple at this time, or do you think you have the same? I think, well, I, th I think. Well, except the straight couple might have children. Now but, yeah, because they them. have, yeah. Other than that, I don't know. That there's well, a it's big difference. I think maybe a lot of. Well, I would say probably a lot of straight couples or more would be more prepared than a lot of gay couples. Unless a gay like if a gay couple's been together for a long time, they're probably more more prepared than some gay couples that haven't been together that long, but the older gay couples. But um, 
I think it's just a lot of stuff you never thought that much about until recently. Like, you know, when you realize that you're not going to live forever. <laughs> you really do have to start thinking about that kind of stuff. And we've accumulated a lot of things. And, and uh, you know, you just kind of think, well, we have to start downsizing. <laughs> I think we're in pretty good shape, but yeah, you never know what's coming ahead. Have you ever had medical issues where your relationship became a problem, or no, like, not did that the relationship became a problem? Uh, not between you, but more with the hospital, or oh no, do you, f you mean with no. visitation? And yeah, things? Uh, no, no, no. no, no. no I've been ha had more issues than he has medically, but. Uh, no, we never had. Right, no, I mean, if I had some kind of surgery or something, he could pick me up or vice versa, I guess. But uh, no, we never really had. Now, I don't know if anything serious happened, what it would be like if, if uh, I would come to see him or he would try to come in and see me. But we never dealt with anything like that. Well, and I, I thought you kind of. times we've always been accepted. I mean, as far as the medical. I mean, on our, like, you know, uh, he's the one that they contact. I mean, they can give him any information if, from my medical mm -hmm. history. If uh, something, if he's the contact, if somebody needs to be contacted. Um, it's the same. With yeah, vice versa. You know, and we never had. No, they never. No one mm -hmm. ever questioned. And you kind of seem that way in general too, right? That you haven't experienced much. We have. Outright. I think we've been maybe lucky. I don't know. But we've never had any issues with and has being there, denied mm -hmm. privileges. Have there been any times where someone's acceptance like surprised you or something like that? Like for the time period or You mean someone else's acceptance, acceptance of either you, you or your relationship or or awareness of your relationship when or Mm -hmm. the, the only there was just there was the only negative uh, situation I came across was when I was a child. There was a family that went to our church, and my I was. They had three sons, and my brother was good friends with the oldest son, and I was good friends with the middle son, and then the other one was younger than we were. But I was really. We got together at each other's houses quite a bit, especially like Sunday after church. And when um, we would see the the my friend was uh, shot by his wife. Uh, he was shot how many? Sixteen times. He was killed after they. Had, um, he was um, he was taking med drugs for steroids and everything, and he had like this roid rage thing, but anyway, his, his wife, but we would see, my family would see his parents, like we would go to Willow Valley restaurant a lot and eat, and the mother would never even acknowledge me when she, she would come over to our table, but she wouldn't even really look at me, and that's the only negative thing, and I, just because she knew, I guess probably you were with Margaret Duncan. I guess you were with me yeah. a couple times, but I think I probably I think introduced I initially at what? I don't think I understood that at the time. No, she didn't, you know, and uh, I don't know if it's, I mean, my, some of it might be that I was a good friend of Ronnie's and then he had so many problems and then his wife uh, shot him, but uh, that was the only time I ever felt kind of the cold shoulder. Hmm. And then, well, and then I, when I think about it now, maybe even the, my father had a man that worked for him and his wife, who I was very close to their family. And I think, well, like when my parents were in Willow Valley, um, uh, this woman and her daughter wanted to go see mom and dad. And my sister and I wanted to meet them down there because we hadn't seen them for a long time. And they went down um, they knew that, but they went down to see them on their own. And I, my sister and I both kind of felt that they just didn't want to, well, I probably thought more than 
my sister. But I just kind of felt like maybe they didn't want to, because they were very religious. The wife was very, this uh, woman's husband worked for my dad for years. And I was close to their family and was good friends with their daughter and everything. And I just kind of feel that maybe Edith, uh, once we started sending her Christmas cards from the two of us and everything, I just kind of think because she's one of these people that has prayer meeting in her house, you know, and all this mm. stuff. And I just kind of think that she just didn't want to see me, I don't think. So why do you think you guys have been together for so long? And We tell everybody it's because we have too many Christmas decorations to split up. <laughs> I don't know. It's we're just... We're very compatible. Yeah, we are, we're compatible. Um, uh, it just works. You get comfortable. I don't know. It's a and comfort level. We just too. love each other. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's, you know, it's... Yeah, we, we do. We have too many Christmas ornaments. <laughs> it just, I, you really do, well, I mean, I guess initially you just kind of took it one day at a time, and then it kind of became a taking a month at a time, and and uh, time flies so fast now when you get older, it's kind of like... You know, when you're talking about, like tonight we're sitting here talking about all these things, you think, my God, was that long ago when this happened or that happened? And, uh... Yes, it does go quickly. <laughs> it does. <laughs> but we do, I mean, we're... Like when we travel overseas or something, he's good at taking care of those kind of things, you know, planning it and everything, and I just let him do that because uh, he's good at it, so, you we know. We go by ourselves, we don't go with. Yeah, we traveled a couple times with, uh, when, when we, we went to Italy, we went with a gay, a, a guy that we knew who was gay, and then a friend of ours, a woman, and they were both Italian, and they had these very strong uh, temperaments. And they chose to. And they stayed together. To be we, roommates. we had a room, you know, and then they stayed oh, yeah. together. Well, well, in the morning, the woman wanted to get up and every morning get up and grab her camera and go through all the cathedrals, and we kind of got tired of that after a while. And that that didn't work out after two weeks. So we decided we would never travel with anybody <laughs> else for two weeks again. Maybe for a week, but not two weeks. <laughs> so we always just go by ourselves for a major. And our pace, like when we, we both love to walk, so when we travel, we walk as much as we can. Um, I mean, we take public transportation mm -hmm. if we have to, but we'll, we'll just walk all day. And we, you know, like if we're traveling someplace, we'll go to the, do, go to museums or whatever during the day, and then in the afternoon we'll go to the beach if it's mm -hmm. a, a beachy area. It's kind of end the day that way. And we're just... We don't have to impress each other, uh, you know, it's, we're not snobs as far as, you know, I mean like we'll go to a mom and pop place to eat or we'll go to a nice restaurant to eat, but we're not, it's just a very comfortable, <laughs> yeah, it just works, yeah, it just mm -hmm. works you know, and, and we kind of know what each other's going to think about this or that, or, um, and I just, if I want to do something now, I just go ahead and do it, and if I want to we talk about buying something and we drag too long about it, then I just go up and do it. Because <laughs> I just yeah, bought a new lawnmower to today and today. I took, he didn't even notice that the grass was mown when he came home, so I took him out the garage and, oh, you got a new mower. <laughs> I would have attempted to fix the old one. It's fine. <laughs> but it's just kind of, you know, it's. Okay, anything else that anyone could think? Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for yes, letting for us do this. Yeah. Doing this for you. Andrew. And in your downsizing, if you find any representative gay paraphernalia. Pa oh, paraphernalia? <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> we probably do have something. That we Disco do. balls, you know, whatever. <laughs> I know I had some. Pins, you know, some buttons, mm -hmm. some place, but I don't know what else we would have. Okay. Well, I don't know if we have any T-shirts or not. Do we have any T-shirts or not? We've we've got we've gotten rid of a lot of. But if you come across stuff. something, we will. Okay. Yeah, we will. We'll let you know.
Thank you.